Hello everyone and welcome to the Herping Hour podcast episode four. It's a very exciting one. We've got Beardy Origins today and I don't know about anyone else but I'm very excited to learn a lot today from good old Stacey. Me too, me too. Uh, <laughs> she's, got, she's got some very cool stuff to talk about today so super excited. No guest, it is just us this time. Uh, we did have some previously amazing guests. I think we have a guest on next week don't we? Yeah. Yes, well, we have a very exciting guest next week, but just us three amazing people. And uh, Stacey, take it away. Thank you. So on this week's episode, we'll be covering a little bit of history, some husbandry slash cur information, including the importance of the third eye in regulating the circadian rhythm. We'll also be covering a section on morphs and genetics and a short section around the common, well, the most common illnesses and some tips to help you whilst you're waiting for a veterinary appointment. Just as a little brief bit of history, the bulk of captive bred bearded dragons today are thought to have originated from stock which was illegally exported from Australia during the 1970s. Many people believe that bearded dragons came from dinosaurs, but they're in fact a lizard, so they're classified separately. And they're part of a group called Lepidosauria, however you pronounce it. <laughs> now everyone's got different ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's a reptilian subgroup that also includes snakes and the now extinct mosasaurs. So reptiles in that group are actually categorised by having like overlapping scales. And that group has been around for about 240 million years since the mid-Triassic period. So they did coexist alongside the dinosaurs. But dinosaurs are actually part of a group called Archaeosauria, which is completely separate from the subgroup Lepidosauria. So that group includes dinosaurs and, by extension, birds, crocodilians and petrosaurs so creatures in that group have a wider assortment of like skin plate types including scoops so they're like the crocodilian and the legs of birds you know that kind of thing and the two groups split off from each other during the triassic period so they produced the various reptile families which have been well basically the archaeosauria and the lepidosaurus but lizards and dinosaurs did grow up together and Obviously, they do today, but in the form of modern lizards and birds. So, mm. But it, it is quite interesting because a lot of the time people thought that dinosaurs, well, dinosaurs are reptiles, but only birds are direct descendants of dinosaurs. So birds are considered to be present day dinosaurs. Bearded dragons are actually a direct descendant of earlier reptile lizards, so, but not dinosaurs. See, this is why bearded dragons are cool. Yeah, they are quite cool. I'm going to go on to the husbandry and curse side of things. I decided to make quite an in-depth curse sheet, really, on, well, general stuff on how to curse for dragons, but also a more in-depth look at UVB and how to get your vivarium set up to what I would consider a high standard, well, an advanced standard of curse, really. So we all know that bearded dragons are one of the most commonly kept animals in captivity. The main bearded dragon that is kept in captivity is the central bearded dragon, so that's the Pagona veticeps. They actually originate in Australia and they, they do tend to span the majority of the country in warmer areas, you know, such as deserts and woodlands and savannas and scrublands, that kind of areas. So a warm habitat is crucial for them in, in captivity. They are cold-blooded and they rely on external heat sources to raise their um, the body temperature. So contrary to popular belief, because I know that a lot of people believe that they don't need as much climbing enrichment and that type of thing, they're actually semi-arboreal and they do like to climb and spend the time between branches and rocks on the ground. So it's better to have both in the vivarium and that's why I decided to do an image that would sort of depict what I would put in my vivarium. Also, they do tend to come out more in the early morning and the later afternoon sun and they spend most of the time hiding away throughout the hottest parts of the day. But originally, it was well documented that they like to come out in the heat of the day, when actually it's now been more recently documented that they don't, they come out in the morning. 
and the late afternoon, which makes a lot of sense really because when I've observed my own dragons, they do tend to come out first thing in the morning as soon as the lights come on and the heat's up to temperature. They tend to go out there for, I'd say, around 30 minutes. Then they retreat back to the cooler end of the vivarium and spend most of the day there until later on in the evening. So I would say that that is definitely the case or would definitely be the case in the wild. So there's actually seven different species of Pregona. They all have a difference in appearance. I can't really show that on the audio, but what I will do is I will put the image on the video which covers for the YouTube, and also it's in the Kerr guide that I've created just, just to show an example of you know, the different looks that you get across the dragon species. So there's the Pagona veticeps, which is also known as the central bearded dragon, which is what we keep. There's the Pagona henry Lassoni, which is also known as the Rankin's dragon. There's the Pagona Barbata, which is also known as the Eastern Bearded Dragon. The Pagona Minor, which is something I'd really like to keep, that's known as the Western Bearded Dragon. There's the Pagona Microlepidota, which is also known as Kimberley's Bearded Dragon. The Pagona Michelli, which is the Northwest Bearded Dragon. And there's the Pagona Nullabar, which is also known as the Nullabar Bearded Dragon. It's interesting, actually, because the Barbata Eastern Dragon, that's got more of a triangular head shape actually and the veticeps has got more of a rounded triangular head shape which I'll show on the image that I put on the screen the pagona minor obviously that's one of the small ones its head it's almost the same shape but it's interesting because the eyes on the pagona minor are wider so the front of the skull is wider on a pagona minor than it is on a central or an eastern bearded dragon but the back of the head where the spikes are and there is are is actually thinner so it, it's quite interesting actually how 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 different they are really that was just a little bit of information around what types there are and you know where they come from i had no idea there was that many yeah they're all, well, I just say agamids, but they're called agamidae, aren't they? But mm. they're all agamids, but they're all their own species. The scientific name is Pagona, but then each species has its subspecies. own, you know, it's it's the subspecies, which are Pagona veticeps, Pagona barbata, that kind of thing. Barbatas have a very <clears throat> nasty attitude, like they're known to be like, Overly aggressive. They are as a, very as a, yeah. as a species. They're very aggressive. Really? Wow. I had no idea. I think about I think three of those I'd heard of. The rest, no idea. So that was very interesting for me. Let's talk about housing. Mm. We recommend a wooden vivarium, which is a minimum of four foot long by two foot wide by two foot tall. So the reason that we recommend a wooden vivarium over a glass vivarium is because the wood holds the heat better. And for that reason, I don't generally suggest glass vivariums to anyone that I give a dragon to. So although glass vivariums can be adapted, it's more difficult to get the right gradients in those than it is in a wooden vivarium. It also takes less time to set up, especially for a new you know, like a beginner. For, say, like a pet keeper. Yeah, for a pet keeper. Just anyone that hasn't kept beforehand. So it's easier to set up a wooden vivarium than it is to set up a glass vivarium. But yeah, a minimum of four foot, we would recommend. Anything bigger is obviously better because they get more floor space to run around. So with regards to bulbs, there's two types of bulbs that are needed in a vivarium. So the first one would be a basking bulb. And with regards to the basking bulb, depending on the size of the enclosure, you'd need between a 75 and 150 watt bulb usually, with the 150 watt being for the above minimum size vivariums. A satisfactory basking temperature is required and needs to be maintained between 105 to 110 Fahrenheit. I, I found that that's the best temperature, even, even for adults, really. I know that some people suggest lowering it down to between 95 and 100 for adults, but we keep ours at around 39 to 40 centigrade, we keep ours at, and they all seem to thrive, so that's what I would recommend. 
so to get the basking spot temperature as near to perfect as you need it to be, we'd recommend starting with a lower wattage bulb on a dimming thermostat and moving it up if necessary. And this is due to external factors, you know, such as vivarium size and room temperatures, especially. If a reptile room is involved, then obviously it can be warmer than average. And that's why we'd suggest starting off with a lower bulb to find the happy medium. For you as a keeper? Find the right temperature gradient yeah. type of thing, or find the right basking temperature. Because you also have to take into account. Yeah. Just because a really strong bulb works for someone else doesn't mean that really strong bulb is going to work for you if you've got, like you said, yeah. reptile room, other factors, things like the, that. When you've got a strong bulb and you've got multiple reptiles using a strong bulb, it then ups the temp of the cool end. And then obviously that makes them uncomfortable because they've got no way to escape, really. Mm. So, yeah. Dragons also need a good temperature gradient. So with this in mind, the opposite end of the vivarium should sit at around 80 Fahrenheit, usually. I would suggest that once the bulb's in place, that you monitor the dragon once everything's set up. And it's because, and I'll always say it, I've said it before, one size doesn't fit all. They're all different. Some prefer it warmer, some prefer it cooler. And I still stick by that. So I would say monitor your dragon once you're starting out on getting the basking temperature correct. And like I said, some some dragons may struggle with higher basking temps. And to see that, they would likely hide away mostly from the area, which would suggest trying a small reduction in heat until you notice that your dragon is basking at more points during early morning and later afternoon. The same goes for if the dragon is the opposite and basks more than what they should. So I'd say basks more throughout the day rather than the generalised time of early morning and later afternoon. If that's the case and that's what you're seeing, then I would suggest upping the temperature slightly. I always say I recommend a one degree increment either way. So whichever behaviour your dragon seems to be displaying, I would either increment it by one degree or decrease it by one degree to see if it helps to regulate the basking time that your dragon's having. That would give you an indication of whether everything's okay or not. And we also recommend either incandescent bulbs or halogen bulbs. You can still use basking bulbs, but... We find that the incandescent and halogen bulbs are better for mimicking the natural sunlight. And that's the reason why we tend to use more of those than the basking bulb, if you can get hold of them. I've noticed that sometimes they're quite low in stock in many places. I mean, Arcadia do still do their own brand of halogen bulb. And we've used those as well, haven't we? We've not had a problem with them. You can use the incandescent bulbs as well. So... The other advice that I would give when setting up a basking area, or to be honest, even an ambient temperature area, is you need it checking and you need it to be accurate. So my advice would be to get a decent heat gun, which is the infrared temperature guns. They will allow you to get an accurate reading. The one thing I would say is don't fire it through the glass because it's wholly inaccurate. Always open the glass to take the temperature reading. When doing temperature readings, I recommend doing the cool end, the middle, which is the ambient, and the hot end so that you know that your gradient's working for you. The second bulb required in a vivarium with a dragon is a UV bulb, also known scientifically as shortwave ultraviolet B. So sunlight is made up of two different rays. There's the long wave ultraviolet A and the short wave ultraviolet B. So reptiles do need an element of both. Well, basking reptiles need an element of both, which they do get from both the basking bulb and the UVB bulb. So you get your UVA from your heat bulb. With the UV bulbs, you do need it to be spanning a quarter to a half of the vivarium, but no more than that. I'd usually say to go with half for a bigger vivarium such as a five foot vivarium if it's a four foot vivarium we do recommend a quarter which is usually a 22 inch kit so if you're using a t8 bulb you'd need it to span three quarters of the vivarium and the reason for this is because it isn't as powerful as 
the T5 high output bulbs. So if you're going to be using a T8 bulb, I'd recommend a 12% Arcadia T8 bulb rather than a 10% for a bearded dragon. Usually we'd recommend between a 6 and a 12% high output T5 bulb. So that would be either the Arcadia 6% or the Arcadia 12% depending on the level of climbing enrichment and basking platform height. We actually prefer to use the 6% T5 bulbs at a distance of roughly 9 to 10 inches away from the back of the Dragon. We have tested this method with a solar meter 6.5R in a 4 by 2 by 2 vivarium setting. The UVI index is between 4 and 5.6 UVI, which is actually the perfect zone for bearded dragons. In Reptile Lighting Group on Facebook, they recommend between 3 and 5 UVI, which is ample for a bearded dragon, with 7 being the very highest, but not recommended due to the variety of morphs that are now available. So a normal scale, normal bearded dragon would probably be able to manage up to the 7%, whereas some of the newer morphs that lack melatonin and that kind of thing, they might not be able to withstand a UVI of seven for as, for as long as a normal bearded dragon would. And for that reason, between three and five is usually ample. So our actual basking area with a 6% bulb is reading at 5.2 UVI. With a 12% bulb, it's reading around 4.5 because of the lack of height to the basking area that we've had to use. So that's why we do recommend a 6% bulb because you can give your dragon more of a basking area and still have ample distance between the dragon and the UV so as not to cause any issues with eyesight or anything like that. So I have put some information on the distance of UVB depending on enclosure size in the new cur sheet that I'm going to be putting up on our group Reptile Intelligence UK. I'll just talk you through a little bit of it. So if you're going to be using a 6% UVB, then the reptile lamp should be positioned between 15 and 20 centimetres above your reptile's head. This will give them a good dose wherever they roam. I've highlighted the one that we use and it must overlap the basking area. That's the key. That's the key element here. And also, so as not to confuse between 6 and 12% bulbs, it is between 15 and 20 centimetres, whereas with the 12%, it's between 15 and 20 inches. So we do recommend the 22-inch kit. The Pro T5 kits are better because they come as an all-in-one unit, so you can literally just plug in power supply and off you go, put your lamp in, and, and that's that. You can get the other types, which you manually attach to either end and put that in. They, they work fine too, but for, for ease, you get your bulb in with the kit and you can just sort of plug and play, really. As I said, with a 12% UV, if you want to go down that route, you'd need it to be positioned between 15 and 20 inches above the reptile's head to maximise the scope of the lamp. I've also put in a diagram, which I'll flash up now on the screen for the YouTube video. And that's been taken from Reptile Lighting Facebook group as well. So all credit goes to them with, with this image. But it gives a perfect example of how your UV light should be positioned with your basking light. And we have gone for the diagonal approach at one end of the vivarium with the basking spot placed in the centre of it, but behind it, if that makes sense. And we find that this gives the best gradient when using a 22-inch kit. This is all part of what is now known as the light and shade method. You can actually still put some light into the vivarium if you want to not fully down to the cool end because obviously that would eliminate the light and shade method, but you can put jungle dawns in or any white LED lights, which would encourage and activate the circadian rhythm in, in the bearded dragon, which I'll discuss a tiny bit more on later down the line in what I'm chatting about. I also decided that I would create my own diagrams. And the reason for that is I know that I get a lot of questions with how do I set up the vivarium, where does everything need to be placed? Them kind of questions. So I do advise if you're not comfortable with using a 6%, then 12 is fine, providing you use the recommended distances. So I've done a diagram for both the 6 and the 12% vivarium setup. 
because of it obviously being a 2D image that I've created, I can't really replicate the diagonal approach of the UV on the diagram, but preferably diagonal is better. In my opinion, you don't have to do it diagonal, but we think it, it makes more sense to do it that way. You can still see what I mean with the previous image that come from Reptile Light in Facebook group. What I decided to do was chat a bit around the UVI distance chart, which is created in the reptile lighting group as well. But it it main, it's just the Arcadia Pro T5 22 inch fixing. It gives a really good example of distances with a six, a 12 and a 14% bulb. Obviously 14% being too high for a dragon. 12% is pretty much bearable. If you've got a taller viv than two foot, then 12% could be quite good especially because you'd then be able to increase the basking zone but in my opinion I'd prefer to use six percent again like I said before because you can you can have more enrichment in that in that area if you're using a lesser percentage bulb but they're still getting adequate UVI. When it comes to lights it is better to get a dimming thermostat that also has a timer plug with it. This is because you can then plug all your UVB into the timer and have both your heating and your lighting controlled at the same time because it's important to keep to the cycles, which you would find in the wild, really. So we tend to stick to a 12-hour cycle throughout the spring and summer months and a 10-hour cycle during the autumn and winter months. So the reason that we tend to use cycles that would mimic the wild is because bearded dragons have got a third eye called the parietal eye, the parietal eye has got a lens, a cornea and a retina and the bearded dragon's third eye does not see images. So instead, the eye uses a biochemical means to detect light. Where's a bearded dragon's third eye? So the parietal eye is connected to the pineal gland and together the parietal eye and the pineal gland are known as the pineal complex, which are both photosensitive. So the third eye usually sends signals to the pineal gland by communicating with optic centre of the brain. The parietal eye has been shown to assist diurnal lizards in regulating the amount of sunlight they need and preventing any excessive metabolic activity, which, as most people know, it does shorten the life. So the parietal eye detects light and dark measuring the photo period of light. The pineal gland produces different hormones depending on the time of day, including, you know, like melatonin. And that obviously helps with the sleep and wake cycle. It's the same in humans. It's the same in most animals, actually. The pineal complex sets the internal clock, detecting the seasons and even the time of day, which then in turn regulates the production of hormones. The third eye actually has a role to play as well in appetite, level of energy, early warning of predators overhead, that kind of thing. It could be the reason that bearded dragons can become scared about being outside when it's used to being indoors. So I've got a dragon like that. His name's Oregon. And he's the most mellow dragon ever, even during breeding season. I mean, he goes black from the tip of under his beard all the way up to the bottom of his, his tail. But he's not aggressive to humans at all. And the minute that you take him into the garden, he just goes mental. He'll puff his beard up, he'll puff his body up, he'll start hissing and everything. He just doesn't like me. He just <laughs> Not <doesn't>... job mode. <laughs> yeah. And it just makes sense that the third eye is the reason why they can become terrified about being outdoors. He recognises he's in an open space. Yeah, they, re they recognise it, don't they? So it makes a lot of sense. And the, the change in the quality and brightness in light from artificial light to sunlight is what probably causes the scared reaction of a bearded dragon when it's been taken from indoors to outdoors. I do know that in 1958, there was experiments conducted on the parietal eye. And although it's an old study, it's still got some quite cool information. So the third eye was actually removed from some types of lizard, mainly iguanas. And the reason for this is because they wanted to see how the lizard would react once it had its third eye removed. I think they then went on to also remove the pineal complex, you know, like the pineal glands. The results from it was that the lizards were slower to seek refuge from a predator 
they emerged earlier in the morning, increased the time that they spent in sunlight and our, or artificial light, increased exposure to high temperatures and subsequently greater activity, but the body temperature was equivalent to a normal lizard. So the increased metabolism combined with the lack of food resulted in quicker death, basically. And lastly, they noticed that the thyroid gland was enlarged. And that was all from studying the removal of a third eye in, in an iguana. It's quite interesting, but we can actually help assist the third eye with our husbandry practices, such as never approaching a bearded dragon from overhead. I think that's a well-known one. Do not provide bearded dragons with light at night because they're obviously a diurnal species. And I have had stink eyes before when I've put the put the reptile room light on. They've opened one eye and just <laughs> literally stirred through my what are you existence. Doing? Yeah. Food, go away. It's honestly, they, they just don't like it. Moving between sunlight and artificial light, another one. Bright tank light is critical to biological functions, so obviously keep the UVB up to date. Your basking light needs to be on, and you can add some white LED lights or get the branded ones, which are the Arcadia Jungle Dawns. And lastly, you can automate the lighting cycles with timers, which is which is a big one, really. That's why I suggested with the dimming thermostat, you get one that's got a timer attached to it because it's much more helpful f- for the circadian rhythm to stay on target. Along with bright light, lighting cycles are needed to ensure that the right level of hormone and other biological functions of the dragon are working correctly. So that's another reason why we would automate the lighting cycles to ensure that there's you know, a consistency similar to that of a natural environment outdoors. It is definitely essential for the bearded dragon's circadian rhythm that they're provided with total darkness and night and bright white light during the day, preferably sunlight. The third eye is actually capable of sensing ultra-red and ultraviolet light, which may disrupt any sleep. It's quite interesting, the circadian rhythm and the, the third eye. So when I do an episode on the UVB, I'll probably go more into depth about it so that people can understand more of the science behind it. But if anyone's wondering what a circadian rhythm is, it's basically, it's exactly the same in humans. It's a physical, mental and behavioural change that follow a 24-hour cycle. So the natural processes that respond primarily to light and dark and affect most living things, like I said, it affects humans, but it also includes any animals, plants, microbes, that kind of thing. So it's a huge part of a captive reptile's life, really. The third eye and the the circadian rhythm go hand in hand together. And in order for them both to work in unison, they both need to have all the needs met. I think I've delved enough into the UVB side and how important it is for the dragon. So I'll move on to substrate now. When you first bring a reptile home, it's always recommended that there should be a quarantine period of at least three months. That is something that we adhere to and that is something that we recommend keeping new and old. Regardless of how many animals you have. Yeah, regardless of how many animals you have, it's always best to have a three-month quarantine period. So... In, during that period, we recommend using kitchen roll or newspaper, something that's easily exchangeable when it comes to clean out time and something that you can visually see that the dragon has pooped on, basically, and you know that everything's working as it should. If loose substrate was given immediately, then obviously feces could be missed and any owner could mistake the reptile for not passing feces. They're ill. No, no, it doesn't matter how good your husbandry is. There is a chance they will become impacted. Yeah. Mm. Once the quarantine's over, there are a number of different ways you can successfully keep a dragon. Although we do recommend the most natural setup as it does reflect how they'd live outside of captivity. Although you can buy products that, that are substrate, you know, like bearded dragon life and that kind of thing, you can actually make your own. So we recommend a sand soil ratio of 50-50. And you can also add excavator clay if you want to, which would mean that if the dragon did dig, it wouldn't collapse as readily as it would with just sand and soil. If you do want to add excavator clay, the ratio that you should take 
is a 50 30 20 so that's 50 sand 30 soil and 20 clay and we only recommend this for dragons that are over six months old below six months old we suggest sticking with kitchen roll lino or you know newspaper which allows you to monitor health for longer i know that a lot of people say only do loose substrate over one year old but in my experience and in my opinion six month old is fine providing that your husbandry is on point Mm. you only really see cases of impaction and that kind of thing when usually something's incorrect with the husbandry so we do and we have kept reptiles on loose substrate from six months old without a problem as usual we'd always say calcium sand should be avoided we we just think it it's not worth it (laughs) for those people who'd rather not use loose substrate because i know it's difficult to know what to believe when there's so many contrasting opinions and there's so much information out there so if it Mm. if it worries you then i would suggest maybe sticking with lino or maybe half line or half tile or slate that kind of appearance i mean i do know people that use half astroturf but obviously more to the cool side because astroturf can heat up quite a lot so if you was going to take that approach it'd be more over to the cool side than it would be to the warm side but for new beginners i'd say lino or or half line or half slate for those that don't want to try loose substrate once the quarantine period's over How do you feel about reptile carpet? The thing with reptile carpet is it's pointless with bearded dragons, especially babies, because it just gets filthy and they poo that much that reptile carpet isn't worth having in with them. Not to mention the fact that it just doesn't look realistic at all anyway. There is a lot of truth in the fact that it does harbour bacteria. So got to do a lot of machine washing and that kind of thing. But in my opinion, I probably would stay away from reptile carpet, especially with dragons, because as it does harbour germs, dragons are so messy when it comes to poop and stuff like that, especially if you don't catch it on the spot clean quite quickly after they've pooped because they'll just keep running through it. It's like with clothes. If you've got a 10-year-old T-shirt, it, no matter how much you wash wash it, it will keep the smell in, like an old smell. Mm. That's what reptile carpet does. So I would say don't use reptile carpet with bearded dragons. It's like, it's one of those things, it's an option, but it's not the best option. Yeah, it's that, an option. In but... captivity, you want to do the best. Yeah, and like Nick was saying, because it does harbour germs, even when you machine wash it, there's germs there. It's easier, if you're going to go down that route, you might as well use kitchen roll because mm. every piece you put back down is clean. You don't, you've not washed it, you've not you know, done anything like that. It's just clean. So if you want a sterile environment, then I'd say use kitchen roll, not, not reptile car. I'm just going to cover a bit about feeding and supplements so with bearded dragon babies they do require a lot of protein in order to continue to grow properly i'd recommend that people feed around two to three times a day so we usually start by throwing a few feeders in at the time to the group because we house our babies in smaller groups of between five and seven dragons it just depends on what the clutch we've had amounts to at the time by throwing a few in at a time you can then see who's taking what and once feeding has taken place any excess bugs that are no longer wanted we can then take out it's always best to watch your reptile once you're feeding them because you'll know what they're eating you'll know how many they've eaten if you don't take them out it can actually stress the animal. So we do recommend that you remove them, but we know that sometimes, especially crickets and dubias actually, that's if you don't use a bowl. You can have stragglers of of either really. So we tend to throw a carrot in overnight and that's just as a precaution that we may not have got them all despite the fact that we think we have. So it just means that It gives the feeder something to go and eat rather than pestering the dragons. We do provide a mix of spring greens daily, which are dusted with calcium. And the thing with that is it's always better to keep offering baby dragons greens, despite the fact that they mainly just pick at them. And that's obviously due to hydration. They're very good for hydration purposes. I know that you sometimes just see them picking here and there, but they will be taking a level of greens on board enough to provide you know some hydration to them and that's better than nothing 
yeah, it's better than nothing. And so we always say, regardless of whether you physically see the dragon eating any, always put them in anyway, because it will then get used to being offered salad as well. So once the dragon reaches around six months old, the feeds can be reduced to around twice a day. When they reach 12 months old, you'd want to reduce down to around one feed a day. And when the dragon reaches 18 months old, the feeds should be reduced one final time to three times a week. And that's the way that we've always worked things. And it's worked for, gosh, plenty years now, <laughs> well, well over a decade. That's what we would recommend. We do always recommend a varied diet because I know that some people will ask, can we just feed one thing? For instance, I've had people ask, oh, we don't like crickets and locusts or anything that runs. Is there any chance we can just feed Morio worms or is there any chance we can just feed buffalo worms, that kind of thing? Don't like anything that has legs. Yeah, people do ask if you can just feed one feeder that might be preferable to them but the short answer to that is no because they do need a varied diet so everything has its place in in the feeding schedule you should be feeding crickets locusts dubia roaches you can also feed silkworms and calci worms as a staple but the likes of morio worms and mealworms should only be fed sparingly because obviously they've got more fat content than other feeders but everything has its place when you're feeding a reptile so regardless of what information you might hear like oh don't feed them them oh don't feed them them i strongly believe that everything has a place and in moderation and with the right feeding schedule, you can provide a varied diet with pretty much all insects. I do think everything has a place and I've included that in the care sheet as well. The other thing for newer keepers to bear in mind is appropriately sized feeders. The general rule of thumb is no wider than the space between the animal's eyes and no longer than the animal's head in length. For instance, for my eight-week-old dragons, I usually feed medium to large crickets, large locusts, medium dubias, and smaller morio worms. As I've just previously said, animals will always thrive more when they're offered a varied diet as opposed to always sticking to the same feeder every time. With regards to ratios, I tend to tell people not to obsess over them too much. So as long as you've got your feeding schedule and what you're supplementing and that kind of thing... That's your schedule. You don't really need to think of it as a ratio. But the ratio that I've always known would be 80% bugs as as a baby and 20% salad. So as the dragon hits adulthood, it just re- it reverses the ratio. So then the ratio then becomes 80% salad and 20% bugs. But like I said, I wouldn't think too much into the ratio side of things as such, providing that you've got your feeding schedule correct and your supplementation schedule correct which brings me to chat about the Arcadia supplement range of products so that's the range that we use and when dusting we do follow their schedule as well the schedule when we follow it with the dragons is per feeds not days and that's because obviously most of our dragons are adults and they only need feeding three times a week so I'll put the I'll put the image up on the screen of what Arcadia recommends. And I've also included that in the, the guide that I've made. They do some really good products. We use Arcadia Earth Pro A, which is a multivitamin that doesn't contain D3 because you don't want a vitamin that contains D3 all of the time when you're using a T5 bulb. We use the we did use Nutriball, but after speaking to canned and doing some extra research we decided to move to the revitalize which is also an arcadia product that does contain d3 so on every eighth feed you can dust with revitalize which does include d3 and it it only needs to be a very very light dusting because they really it's just to make sure that they're getting what they need particularly with babies you want to make sure that they're getting the right amount of d3 so I guess it's just as a safeguarding, really, that you can add the dusting on the eighth feed in. But again, research shows that it's not actually necessary as such. It's just as a precaution. With regards to the feeding schedule, the first three feeds are Earth Pro A, which is without the D3 in. 
the fourth feed is calcium pro MG. And then the three subsequent feeds after that are also earth pro A. And like I said, the eighth feed is the revitalize. You can also, if you really want to, there is a shed support supplement that you can use and it can be added to the diet over the shedding period. So when you notice that your dragon is coming into the white and they're going to have a shed, you can include a dusting of shed support alongside your other supplements just so that it it helps with the um, the shedding. So that's always recommended because I know there was a question that asked about what's the best way to get the shed from round bearded dragon's eyes. Mm-hmm. So if you are using the Arcadia supplement regime, you can... You can try all the shed support around the time that you that your dragon is going into shed. You can obviously you can use it with all reptile species. It's it's safe, but you can use it with your dragon. The other thing is with with shedding. I do know that it can get stuck in funny places, but the best thing that you can do is to give them a shallow bath in just lukewarm water or room temperature water. Trickle the water over the head. Give them. I say give them five or ten minutes in the water. After that, it becomes quite soft, so they can usually go back into the vivarium and rub it off themselves, providing that you've got the right amount of branches and bark and that kind of thing that they can rub the body onto to safely get the shed away. If that's not the case, you can soak their eyes to make it a bit looser and then use a cotton bud very gently around that area to get the skin off. You can use your hands if you want, if you feel like you're more confident in doing that. If not, you can use a a wet cotton bud that usually helps with pushing it out. So I'm just going to go through a couple of things that I think is important when keeping a bearded dragon as well, especially if you're keeping them for the first time. I've included a warning in the in the cur guide that's because people think that bearded dragons are sociable and they're not they're not social animals they like to be on their own when you see a bearded dragon hugging they're not hugging they're showing dominance they don't want to share the territory mm. so you, the warning i've included is your animals should be housed separately if left in a setup together you can it can lead to fighting and it can also lead to death nip tails so, Yeah, we've got a bearded dragon called Apricot and she's off a good friend of ours. And unfortunately, she was she was sold to somebody that was dishonest to to our friend. And the dragon was a baby and she got put in with an adult dragon. Now, she unfortunately had her tail ripped off and thankfully she was took to the vet quite quickly. And the vet had to amputate further up the tail to save it. Her nickname is Stumpy, but her name is actually Apricot. But she's thriving. She's fine. She's doing well. She'll live out her days with us. But that's just a perfect example of Mm. why you shouldn't cohabit. And especially, you wouldn't add a baby bearded dragon to an adult vivarium. The likelihood is that the baby will either be severely injured or eaten. Or eaten, yeah. And it's a horrible thing to happen, but you need to go into it knowing that they aren't sociable animals. They don't want to be housed together with any any other animals. Is there any signs that you can look out for to know that, you know, if you if you say go into a shop or have a friend that's housing them together, is there any signs that you can point out to said people, said person, uh, of an unhappy dragon or of a, of a dragon or dragons that are going to end up fighting, things like that, sort of like the dominance behaviour? Well, you find that there's always one that is picked on more than the rest and they spend a lot of time losing weight, actually. You yeah. find that they lose weight, they don't want to eat as much or they can't eat as much because the food's taken. Other thing to watch for with bearded dragons is because they've got a lot of behavioural traits, so the likes of males will obviously get the black beard, they'll puff out, they'll head bob. They head bob for dominance, but they also head bob very, very fast if they're doing it for dominance over a female, whereas females will head bob in a very slow motion and arm wave to accept a male. But they will also head bob. Well, it's more like, I find that it's more like they'll lower the head rather than bob it to say I'm submitting and 
you know, it's fine. You can you can be able. That's a lot of the time. That's usually with males. You find that the first instance that I said about the not eating and the the being picked at and being lied on top of a lot. That's usually one of the signs because it's a lot of dominant. Me just stop with the whole. They're fine. If they started fighting, I'll split them up. It shouldn't. You shouldn't be waiting for yeah. it to get to that point. Like you shouldn't be waiting for your animals to get injured before you know you actually start listening. It shouldn't have to come to that. You you know, so housing them together, especially beardies, it's just, it's just from pure laziness. At the end of the day, it's either you don't want to buy the extra viv or you know you don't want to spend the extra money. To me, it is just pure laziness. Obviously, if if they don't know, and obviously they even know you know pet stores and all that have given them false information that's a completely different story that's them just you know not not genuinely knowing but if they do know and are aware and have been told and they're still choosing to be like no they're fine they're friends they love each other then yeah I think it's just just pure laziness and um yeah I'm not not a huge fan of it when it comes to I'm always seeing that as an uh, excuse to why they do it I don't think it should be a case of if something happens I'll split them up because that something could be a dead dragon yeah and a hefty vet bill for the other one and the other thing to consider as well is so if you've got more than one female in a vivarium when a bearded dragon is ovulating the female can become quite aggressive to other females in the vicinity Mm -hmm. and that's usually when fights start start to happen more so than any other time that's something to take into consideration as well it's not so bad with females outside of the vivarium because it's a neutral a neutral territory. So they don't tend to be as fussed by one another when they're not in their space. When they're in their space, they're just tolerating one another. And unfortunately, people fail to see that a lot of the time. They think, people just think they're best friends. Yeah, and it's not. It's not the case at all. One of them is lower on the hierarchy than the other and generally if they was to put a foot out of line then the other one that wouldn't would not exist for much longer no exactly just a few other bits that i think is important when you're keeping a bearded dragon so i tend to soak my dragons between one to three times a week and because it helps with hydration and cleaning, especially when they're younger because they're so mucky. I know that some people say, oh, no, don't bath them at all. And some people say, oh, only bath them once a week. But it's something that has always worked with me and I'm happy with that approach. The other thing is I do recommend a parasite check at least once a year. It can be done via an online outlet that checks for parasites. And they do send you like a PDF of the results and then you can forward them on or take them into your local reptile vet if treatment is needed because usually it's like a traffic light system when you get parasite results and they will advise you if they think that treatment is needed Mm. or they will say, look, it's slightly high, speak to your vet and see whether they think treatment is needed. So sometimes they don't give a definitive answer. They say, speak to your vet first, see what they say. But I do think it's important. I mean, you can also go for something like a yearly check, which they'll run a parasite test at your vets in the yearly check anyway. But I do recommend you do it around, say, the end of September, beginning of October. And the reason for that is brumation, which is the bearded dragon version of hibernation. If you're going to... So looking at it from just a keeper perspective, you can't let your dragon go into brumation without knowing whether it's got a parasite load or not because the parasites can kill your dragon whilst it's bromating. They can strip it of its nutrients and that kind of thing and unfortunately the dragon won't make it. So it's always best to get a parasite test in that respect so that you're keeping your dragon safe. On the flip side, when it comes to breeding dragons, it's always best to get any of the breeders that you're planning on purring in the new breeding season parasite checked because you don't want to pass them on to any babies and also you don't want to have the same thing occur when brumation might occur because I find more often than not it's usually the males that go into brumation more than what the females do and it's just a good idea to always have them health checked before they go into that state 
another thing is if you've got babies under one year old, if your husbandry is on point, they generally won't go into bromation because it's not something that they do in the first year usually. If you find that they start going into bromation early, then you probably need a vet check just to double check that everything's as it should be. The other thing is all reptiles do carry small amounts of pinworm in the system anyway. It's just when it's coupled with other parasite flare-ups, such as, you know, like cachidia or protozoa, the pinworm will then become a problem because it reaches higher levels. So that's one thing to consider. So a lot of the time when you get parasite test results, they come back with pinworm and that's okay in small amounts because oddly enough, none of the vets have ever agreed on a a parasite count scale. Mm. So a lot of the time they've all got their own scales that they find within reasonable margins, shall we say. For some reason it's never been it's never been cast iron the scale of how much pinworm you can have in your system or how much you can't have in your system, that kind of thing. So each each vet you'll find that does a parasite check, the margins will be completely different to the next vet that does a parasite check or a parasite check that's done online, that kind of thing. There is similarities in the margins that they use. There has to be in in one sense, but Mm -hmm. for some reason, it's not something that they've ever set in stone, which I find strange, but it's just... Yeah, it's kind of strange, isn't it? Yeah, it's... For some reason, it's just the way that they tend to work. Providing that the pinworm's in low amounts, then that's completely normal. Usually, it's not something that vets will treat because, like I said, it's already part of the makeup, really. And lastly, the other thing to look out for is any sort of cues for possible parasite infestation. Say, for instance, earlier in the year than what you would usually test, your dragon might start having a loss of appetite, weight loss, lethargy, loose smelly stool, pale gums or tongue, they can all be signs of a parasite infection. So I would suggest if you have any of those type of symptoms, then a vet check is probably needed or send off for a parasite check and, you know, just to be on the safe side. Even it's if better it's- to be safe than sorry. Yeah. Even if it is a bit earlier in the year than what you would usually test, it's better to get tested and do it that way. The other thing we keep in Bearded Dragons is, I'm going to do a separate podcast on this because although I'm going to chat quickly about common illnesses, I think and feel it would be good to have a podcast that maybe went a bit more in depth about each one and the symptoms specifically for each one and what you can maybe do to help whilst you're waiting for veterinary treatment. With regards to the more common ones, so you've got your metabolic bone disease, also known as MBD. You've got your mouth rot. You've got your parasites, which, you know, there's multiple different types. So if I do a separate podcast, we can discuss the nature of each parasite and the form of treatment that's, you know, that's given for particular kinds of parasite and how they affect the body. There's respiratory infections. There's yolk colomitis, which is quite an in-depth one to cover that one, actually. It's it's becoming more and more common in this day and age now because females are getting overfed. Well, males are getting overfed as well, but what I mean is females, it's detrimental to not to be overfed because if a female dragon's well cared for with lots of calcium, vitamins, gut-loaded insects, vegetables, fruits, then a body puts the extra nutrients into developing egg follicles. And what I mean by that is they like eggs, but they don't have a shell, so they can't be laid. And that means that she's then carrying a load of egg yolks and they're never going to be absorbed and they're never going to turn into actual eggs. With that in mind, eventually the yolks get so big inside the female that it then causes an infection called yolk peritonitis. It either causes an infection or the yolks burst. And if the yolks burst, it then causes the infection anyway. If you go into Reptile Intelligence UK, search for yolk colomitis, I did a big write-up on it and it pretty much covers everything that you need to know, including symptoms and treatment, which unfortunately rarely 
you're able to get to a vet in time for treatment to take place, which the treatment is obviously the removal of the ovaries and everything included. So if you get your dragon there on time, then I've known some dragons to have a good chance of survival. Usually, unfortunately, it's too late by the time they start displaying symptoms. It's not a very good outcome, unfortunately. But if you... If you're interested in reading about it before I do the podcast that specifically outlines what it is, why it happens, all the symptoms, then you can read up about it. And I've also included a diagram of the bearded dragon and where the follicles are in relation to the body part. It's quite interesting. If you're interested in knowing more about that, then have a quick read of it. The other one is adenovirus. So... There's quite a lot of dispute over that in recent years, whether it's real, whether it's not, that kind of thing. It's definitely, there's definitely something. I'll speak more in depth about that on the other podcast as well. With regards to what you can try and do to keep on top of your dragon's health, I'm not a reptile vet or a reptile health expert. This is just based on my own experience my own observation and if you do have an emergency then I'd recommend that you call a vet ASAP. In my opinion it's better to wear your bearded dragon weekly because sudden weight loss can indicate a health issue. Keep a weekly record of weight, feeding habits, behaviour, shedding, then you, you've got everything there in front of you to say well hmm my dragon's behaving a bit differently and here's the records that prove that and lastly I would always recommend that you prepare a reptile first aid kit so if they do become ill or need any extra help you've got everything there at home until you can manage to get to the vets when they've got an appointment this is just what I've got at home in my first aid kit tamadine critical care formula five mil syringes tweezers Verm X and Reptiboost. All of them things are a really good thing to have in your reptile cupboard. And all of them are really good and really helpful for different things. So obviously Tamadine's an antibacterial wound cleaner. Very good if your reptile accidentally gets a cut or a burn. It's just a good all rounder for that helped me a lot with Zero when I had Yeah. Zero. Yeah, I remember t- I remember saying use Tamadine and it did help you care formula you can make that i tend to if i ever need to use that with a dragon or or a leo or anything like that i tend to make it into a watery substance that i can put in a syringe although it can be made into a paste that you can feed to them i prefer to just put it into a syringe because it's just easier to administer and that's got all your vitamins in it's got protein in it can be used to solely feed a reptile whilst they're in recovery from anything really maybe an operation that kind of thing it will give them everything they need for the short-term scenario the five mil syringes are what we use you can get loads to be honest on ebay you can get like a pack of 50 for less than a tenner but obviously they don't need needles on or anything like that it's just purely a plastic syringe that you can use to administer your critical care or repti boost that kind of thing Tweezers, I always find tweezers are really helpful because if you get a dragon with a stuck nose trumpet, as I call them, you can, you can use them to, to help remove them. If, it's, if it looks like it's starting to aggravate the dragon, nine times out of ten, they'll get rid of it themselves. It's just the shed skin that goes into the nose because they've got really long nose canals. But there's always one eventually that might need a bit of extra help alternatively as well when Helios was alive we had to use tweezers sometimes to remove food from his throat because he was terrible for storing food in his throat and the vets removed it a few times as well with tweezers so we we have a set of long tweezers that if should any animal start to choke we're able to remove what is in the throat visually if it's too far down in which case that happened to Helios the last time he was at the vet before he passed away they had to use a suction on him to remove it from his throat an led torch is another one that we've got as well because they're really handy to have you can use the torch in in unison with with the tweezers if you ever need to remove anything but we've only had to do that with one dragon 
And that's because genetically he wasn't the best and he had these problems and unfortunately he didn't he didn't survive. But we had everything there that we could that would help him and he had numerous vet visits. So a torch and tweezers are always a good thing to have. Vermex, I find that that's a really good thing to have. You dust your feeders across three days once a month and it promotes healthy gut bacteria. So it's actually good for keeping parasites at bay and that kind of thing and keeping the intestines working properly. So yeah, that's another good one to have in in the kit. And lastly is Reptiboost. I always find that Reptiboost is awesome when you've got a female that's ovulating, even if you're not breeding her, or you've got a gravid female, or you've got a female that's just laid eggs and needs a boost. It provides them with some extra vitamins to get them back to optimal health after the breeding season. And we use it for that. So that's what I'd recommend in a reptile first aid kit. So I'm just going to share some information about bearded dragon genetics, because in all honesty, I see it all the time. People purring moths that shouldn't really be purred and taking the strength of the gene back a few years by doing it. It's sort of like five steps forward and 10 steps backwards. Oh, the um, worst. Yeah, and especially in bearded dragons. So unless you're willing to strengthen them, then you're just making them weaker. Mm. It's easier to explain the morphs first. Right, so there's eight existing incomplete dominant, dominant recessive genetics currently in the species. So that is the hypomelanistic, which is also known as the hypo. There's the translucent, which is also known as the trans. There's the American leather, the Italian leather, and the silk back. There's the phantom leather, which is actually a recessive leather. There's the donna, the whip blitz, the zero, and the silver back. So let's start off with tiger isn't a morph. It's a lime bred pattern phase. The interesting one is genetic stripe. That also isn't a morph. It's a lime bred pattern phase. The phantom stripe isn't a morph, it's a lime bread colour phase. Colour or visual stripe isn't a morph, it's a lime bread colour phase that is derived from actual phantom stripe lineage, which is Tracy Saltmarsh in America. She runs Phantom Dragons. In fact, we've got most of the morphs that we've got today because of her and a, a partner that worked on them and run them through the ranks to get them to be healthy. Another one is colour is not a morph. You see a lot of the time people suggesting that the colour's a morph. It's not a morph. Hypo, which is actually my one of my favourites, it's a recessive. It's a reduction of dark pigment in the animal. And the nails will always usually appear to be opaque or yellow. The translucent gene is a recessive. It's basically a lack of white pigment. The animals appear sort of gummy and more intensely coloured so Santaru I kept back from my coral project oh those that that is such a yeah, cool she, I'll, I'll see I'll put a photo on actually whilst we're chatting on on this part and I'll show you what I mean by gummy you'll see straight away what what it means so as babies the bellies also appear blue and sometimes above their eyes will also have a blue tint. I've found that 99% of translucents do have a blue-black tint over their eyes. You can tell usually as soon as their eyelids out the egg, whether they're going to be translucent. Blue eyelid. Yeah. The American leather is a form of incomplete dominant leather that pops out in the USA. It's less consistent in scale reduction than an Italian leather. It is also compatible with an Italian leather, so... When bred together, they can produce the homozygous form, which is obviously what we know as the siltback. The Italian leather is a for another form of incomplete dominant leather that popped out in Italy. It's got quite a consistent scale reduction and it's quite a bit smoother than the American leather. So incomplete dominant animals are usually actually visual hets. They're the heter heterozygous form of a siltback. So the siltback is the homozygous super form of a leatherback. Silks lack scale completely with some retaining the pseudo scales. So I know there's a question about do I agree with breeding siltbacks? The answer, well, the short answer to that is no. I do know that in order to sometimes further a project, siltbacks have to be created. And usually in that respect, not many pop out 
I personally don't breed them, but I think that anybody that does should already have homes available for them because they've got extra needs with regards to the skin. So because the skin is so sensitive, usually it needs to be moisturised. And ugly. yeah, I just, I just don't, I just wouldn't do it. I do disagree with breeding, breeding for silk backs purposely. It's a no, it's a no. They have quite a hefty price tag on them. Sometimes, yes. And I do believe it's the people that don't know what they're actually doing that put a hefty price tag on them. They think, oh, wow, these are silk backs. We've created something awesome. That's what we was aiming to hit. Well, uh... I wouldn't aim to hit that at all. And I do know that breeders who do try and further genes sometimes have to create them. They're not doing it purposely to create silk wax. They're doing it to create a stronger gene because not all of the clutch would be silk wax, if that makes sense. Mm. So you can kind of tell who's doing it for... Yeah, definitely. What reasons? Yeah, 100 Kind of by the price tag, okay. Yeah. No. 150,000% no. They shouldn't be bred purposely. You're taking away all of an animal's natural defences. Mm. What... The fact that you like the look of them, and that's not on. That's that's not fair. So I know a breeder who was purposely breeding them and then selling them. But you have to be educated when you take on a silk back because the slightest scratch completely tears the skin. They've got to constantly be moisturized. They're awful at shedding. So you're just stripping everything that a bearded dragon is known for. Mm. Their hardiness, their skin toughness, everything. You don't give them any of that. You basically producing a defenseless animal yeah uv they, they've got no protection against uv at all so no i don't agree with it them and thunderbolts wait what's a thunderbolt a genetic time bomb oh is it oh. going to be one of them geneticals again so basically three different morphs to create a stronger color pattern a stronger unique color pattern but the way they're paired together, so it's like they'll put closely related trans together now you shouldn't do that because it causes it can cause severe neurological issues in the animals. Thunderbolts usually die within the first couple of years. Like like siltbacks, siltbacks don't have a good lifespan. They just don't. They usually die before the five. So within the first two years of life, most siltbacks will die. Thunderbolts are the same. It's a genetic mess. Now people who say, oh yeah, we've got really good, uh, a really strong line of thunderbolts and stuff. Like well, you shouldn't be pairing them anyway. This is it's been proven. There is none of the original line left. No, there's none. So of the they're not really true. Thunderbolts. Thunderbolts are so. It's like the German giant. There's no true German giants left. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a genetic mess, and I don't agree with people pairing it because you're too close. So with dragon genetics, it's it takes many years, like many years, for the line to be strong enough. So for hypo. It can now be paired hypo to hypo instead of head to head because it's a strong line now. It's been around that long and it's been outsourced. That makes mm. sense. Yeah. Trans is still on the iffy side because, as I said, trans to trans can cause genetic no- uh, genetic neurological issues Some such as tremors, balance issues. Back The back legs are usually largely affected in a double trans purring. But visually, at birth, that can happen. When you're looking at the the longer lasting effects that only start to appear once a dragon matures, you're looking at tremors and balance problems. And I've also noticed that they don't absorb the supplements as well as what other dragons do. So it drastically reduces the lifespan. And actually, Amy in America from Upscale Dragons, she's been chatting a lot about it lately lately because of um a mishap that happened in her breeding and uh i think she's done an awesome job at bringing it to the forefront you know this is what happens when a double trans purring occurs and if you are not convinced now that you shouldn't do it then have a look at these images if you're not convinced after them then you know you're doing something no, wrong and- Got no morals. Mm, you've got no morals. Cinema. So she's been really transparent and she's been really informative about it. And that's the best way to be. If something's happened, let's all learn from it. It, it needs to be said. I mean, what are people gaining from purposely purring things that would Money. cause cause a mess? Well, yeah, I mean, I, yes, people say money. 
But a lot of time and effort goes into bringing them up and stuff like that. And I get what... Not yeah. everyone puts in the work that you do, though. Yeah. Not know, everyone goes above and beyond to ensure that their geckos are of uh, their geckos, their beardies are of the highest quality and are of the best condition. So, yeah, you and, you know, and, and whoever you, obviously, I'm not a beardy breeder, but whoever you and whoever you think and all the other people that, you know, go above and beyond, they're not going to be making, a, you know, a profit, as people call it, because mm. of how much time and energy and all that food all that varied diet it's, it's not it's not cheap it's expensive and you're not going to be seeing anything out of that but you know you've got happy animals and and happy new owners with yeah. with a new pet and all that but not everyone goes through all that extra time because it's a lot of work oh it's a lot of work isn't it? it's a lot of work and that takes out of their profit and so not a lot of people Mm. are going to be putting in that extra work because they want the biggest profit I so a lot of people would be doing it for profit and and preying mm. on people that either don't know genetics or you know and things like that well nine times out of ten with a double trans purring if you don't have a baby that's got a visual problem they will have a neurological one further mm. down the line and that's the that's the harsh reality of it it's the same with the zero gene it's not strong. It's just not strong at all. And I know that Tracy of Phantom, she's had so many disagreements with people online because their philosophy is, well, I've got five babies that have, that have been healthy out of it. So, but what about the other 20 babies you hatch that aren't? They've got like deformities, a reduced lifespan, probably um, genital issues that you can't visually see. Like, mm. it's not a strong line. And as, as Stacey mentioned earlier, she's the one that has, her and Josh are the ones that have strengthened this line, trying to put us forward with it. And every time a visual to visual or visual to het is paired, you're putting that line five years back because it's then being palmed off to someone with all its issues who might not be aware of the issues, who then pair it on and the cycle continues. So that's, I think people forget that you need to be able to, your tra- your breeder needs to be pr- transparent with what they're doing. Any decent breeder will happily, they might not always want to show your parents. I know some big breeders don't like showing parents because obviously there is a few people who have a business of it, all the, like the, the right channels and everything. So they've got a lot at stake. So when you won't have the parents being seen and stuff because they're then a target for people who want to steal and things like that, completely mm-hmm. understandable, but they will tell you and know the lineage they'll know the entire lineage so usually they'll have grandparents info and everything and they'll be transparent about it but you so this way it comes in you need to trust the breeder you're going to and they you need to know some knowledge yourself Mm. say i'm gone that what they're saying doesn't add up at all from everything i've learned Mm. yeah don't be afraid to call people out if you think it's wrong because it could just be that you have accidentally mixed up a bit of information in your head and they can help you like obviously as long as you're not doing it in sort of like a you know you're wrong I've learned this I know more than you I've been here two minutes like as long as you're not doing it in that way and you're genuinely just trying to learn I don't see anyone that's decent having an issue with that and having an issue with helping because at the end of the day the more people that have beardies like that's more people in the community that's more people you know strengthening lines as you said you know and, and doing and helping and it's more of a community isn't it because you it know more of a commu- like, the more like, the merrier it's it's yeah it, you need to you need to be open with your thinking of it whether mm. it be with the genetics or with the husbandry now i know a lot of beardy communities are stuck in their ways and it's at the detrimental effect to that beardy's health like overexposure to uv overfeeding over supplementing you know that sort of stuff but like humanizing the animal oh it's come out it's cuddled it's fell asleep on me cuddling it's like it's fell asleep because it's cold that's the short and tall of it the animal is cold this is why we keep them in controlled regulated environments so breeder keeper somebody interested doesn't matter you need to be open to learn just because you've worked with the animal for what 40 years doesn't mean you know all the answers because science and technology is constantly changing no such thing open to that change it's like i still see now people recommending for night time give a dragon a heat mat that's pointless don't give your dragon a heat mat at night in Mm. fact let the temperature drop all species should have a temperature drop because that's what happens in the wild 
You don't need a 24-hour regulated environment of constant heat, the same heat. They don't come out to bask at night. They're they keeping. Yeah, they don't, they don't come out to bask at night. They go off and they burrow, which is why we provide hides and stuff, because they'll go off and they'll find somewhere secure to hide. What's the, what's the biggest, what's the less chance you're going to get eaten hiding away? Hmm. You can't see me. So uh, it's like with the DHP thing with Leos and stuff. Oh, just keep it at a constant temp 24 hours with the DHP because it doesn't emit light. No, don't. Have hmm. a light emitting bulb through the day. And if you want to get really fancy, instead of using a DHP overnight, use a chi and just produce air heat. You don't need a basking spot overnight. Have a bit of te- a, a, a nice air heat, a nice ambient temp overnight of about 24 and you're sorted be open to change but the one thing that annoys me is don't take everything you see as gospel because it gets misconstrued Mm. it's the same as with regards to translucent purins again because it is still a relatively weak gene even visual to het is a risk unless you really know that they are not related and there's a wide berth between genetics so you still have the possibility of having some issues if you know that that there's a chance of relatives kind of thing. So if I try to do a trans to het purring, I have to know without a doubt that they are not closely related in any way, shape or form. So it's still a risk in a way unless you really know where your dragons are coming from kind of thing. And you've got a lot of in-depth genetic knowledge with with regards of the, per, you know, the lineage. So it's still a risk. So with the phantom leather, now this one is Tracy Saltmarsh's own, own line. It's a recessive form of leatherback and it was first produced in 2004 by phantom dragons. The animals are smooth dorsolaterally with almost normal scalation over the rest of the body so when bred together they don't produce silk back dragons the entire clutch is a visual phantom leather it works like any other recessive genetic heritability wise when you have an animal that expresses the incomplete dominant leather and a phantom leather it's a true micro leather animal they're extremely smooth and between that of a silk back and a really smooth, incomplete, dominant leather. So that's the that's the phantom dragon's phantom leather. So there's the Dunner. That's a dominant genetic that popped out and it was propagated by Kevin Dunner of Dragon's Den. The Dunner has got nothing to do with colour or pattern and everything to do with scale shape and arrangement on the animal. So the scales are more conical in shape. For those who don't know what that means, it's like circular and they don't lay flat in one direction on the animal. So the scales are sort of haphazardly arranged, you know, especially on the stomach and under the beard as well. The scale shape and arrangement causes the pattern to express differently in in those types of animals, but you can have a patternless zero whip blitz donor. So yeah, it's quite a cool one actually, but if bred incorrectly, they do have the problems. So they have problems with being able to take a deep breath, and that's what Helios had the issue with. And some, t- I mean, donors are renowned for storing food in the throat, so they'll leave it there for a while before they decide to swallow it properly. That just seems to be a donor trait overall. But I think overall, they're actually really quite a strong gene if bred correctly. So a zero is a recessive masking genetic that masks colour and pattern in the animal, resulting in a silver grey colour. If you add hypo to that, you'll get a white animal. If you add trans to that, you'll get a purple grey zero. And if you add both hypo and trans, you'll get a lavender purple coloured zero, which is quite nice, actually. Yeah, it's cool how how hypo and trans can affect the colouring. The white ones are my my favourite. I've always wanted a white one. We've created ones that are 100% het for hypo and there's a possibility they're het for trans, but they're also 66% het for zero. And that's because both the parents was 100% het zeros. So they'll pretty much be a silver grey colour. I love those kiddos. They are quite cute, aren't they? Your hold back. Isn't he a spicy nugget? He's lovely, isn't he? 
The other one's whip blitz. That's a recessive masking genetic that masks the pattern and mutes the colour. So usually when you see a whip blitz, they're actually like a dusty pinky yellow colour, which is very, very pretty, but it does mute the colour. So they, they almost look dusty or pastely. They're quite nice. I, I quite like them. I've not got one myself. I won't be breeding them or anything like that. I probably won't breed zeros again, actually. I'll just focus on my main projects, which are Arisia and me reds and stuff. Like oh, that. So your reds. I'll have some what, what is your favourite more? I like the hypo just because... I know it's basically one of the bog standard morphs that came about quite a while ago. But the reason I like it is because it reduces the dark pigment in the animal. So you can end up with brighter colours from it. And I just really like how it affects the colour on the animal. Although saying that, these that we produce now, they're coming through with really cool copper brown colours on, you know, some of the dunners. And I'm so tempted by one of the males and, and I just keep saying, nope, nope, nope. Do it, do but it. He's so nice. He's like um, a copper. He's just like a copper bearded dragon. It's, it's you know, like um, the colour of a, a penny. Mm, do it. You'd have a new line of copper beardies. It is really nice. So, But I do, I do really like me red. So anything that's got red in, blue in, um, I, I love those colour phases and stuff like that. But as, as an actual morph, it has to be the recessive morph, which is the hypo. I definitely need a red beardy to go with my red cresties and my red gargs. <laughs> well, I'll be purring a Rizia at the beginning of next year to Yondu. Oh, so Yondu. He's much more red than his dad is because his dad's more tangerine. And obviously his mum's a coral red. So I would expect them to have, in fact, they're going to have massive babies because Arisia is bigger than he is and <laughs> pretty much fully grown now. So oh, That's going to be great. I'm excited for those babies. Yeah, she's... I love your um, red she's baby. Got, um, she's quite pastel-y in colour. So she's like pastel yellow and red. Mm. And she's got really nice blue bars. And because he's he's... Not coral red. Photos can be deceiving because they make him look a bit more orangey, but he's not. He's actually red. Oh, um, don't even talk so... about trying to get red on camera. <laughs> I think they'll have some really nice babies because I held him back because he had such prominent blue bars. And she's got even more prominent blue bars than he has. So I would expect them. She's also a genetic stripe. I know it's called a genetic stripe and it's a line bread pattern phase, yeah. but... That's just the name of just just what it is. She is she is one of them, so she will produce some babies with stripes, which will be nice. And just as a note to most people, Wero is not a morph; it's just a combination of Whitblitz and Zero together. Silverback, it's an interesting one. It's a recessive genetic, and it's extremely limited in the hobby because of scams. Tracy Saltmarsh doesn't know anyone else with the genetic besides herself at Phantom Dragons, but it takes about six months for the animal to show the trait. The gene actually causes the animal to slowly lose pattern and colour, resulting in a sort of silver grey animal. To be honest, it, it doesn't really matter for us in the UK because we don't have them here anyway, and they're not readily available to anyone else either, so it's just a bit of information. Just a quick... A very quick note on albionism. A number of years back, it did pop up in a group of animals in Australia, but they weren't able to ever stabilise it, so it disappeared. So it doesn't really exist anymore in The Hobbit. Although I did see a photo recently which looked like there was two albino dragons. If that's the case, I can't see that they'll be able to stabilise it enough to make it work. And unfortunately... If it was a real photograph, then the babies probably won't live very long. But anyway, when purring recessive genes other than hypo, as that's quite a predominantly strong gene now, I would always say it's best to purr het rather than visual to visual or visual to het. But that's only because the genes are still weak in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, translucent to het, as I was just saying, it's okay in some circumstances if you know that the lines are not closely related and that you're able to continue strengthening the line. But predominantly, I would suggest it's always head to head. It's the same with colour mutations. 
lines shouldn't shouldn't be continually closely bred just to bring out the most insane colours, you know, that's possible. But they are. People are still breeding closely related lines just to bring out insane colours. So as an example, only a small fraction of a clutch will have, say, one or two of the colour you actually want to work with. So it's the same as if you chose one from a clutch of intense reds that wasn't the brightest. It could also produce intense reds. Mm. So it's that is why it is called selective breeding. It's the way forward to further the structure as well as the, you know, as well as strengthen the genetic. Bearded dragon genetics are really interesting and um, it's good to know when you are planning on breeding what exactly you're working with and what each gene is because a lot of what people class as morphs aren't really morphs, the colour phases, uh, pattern phases, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I think it's good to chat around what genetics really are. Let's do some questions then. So we have, what's the most incorrect thing you've ever heard about beardies? Okay, so there's a few. The first one would be dragons require a heat mat overnight. They don't. A nice room ambient temp is good enough for them. As long as it doesn't drop below 16 degrees, prolonged prolonged periods, your dragon will be just fine. Another one would be dragons can't see the colour red. Dragons can. They're a diurnal species with full cone receptors. That means they can pick up on lights and ultraviolet lights that not even our eye can pick up on. They can see it. My dragon's cuddling me. My dragon, must be ha- <laughs> My dragon must be happy because it fell asleep on me. I think, I think this is where misinformation comes into play. We, we humanise animals too much. The reality of that one is your dragon is asleep on you because it's out of its controlled environment during the day and it's cold. They associate lower temp drops as nighttime. Mm. So they automatically go off to sleep to conserve energy because in the wild they would not be be, being fed every day. They'd be having to hunt for it and whatnot. So they are spoiled. Yes, they're very spoiled. The dragon needs to be fed every day. That's another one. They don't. In fact, they're designed to go extended periods of time without both food and water. So what we're essentially doing by feeding them every day is creating lazy, obese animals which is detrimental to them like i know people find it cute so i look at the chunky animal but mm. when you sit and you think about it logically you are causing an excess fat buildup which is then in turn crushing internal organs yeah literally yeah so be realistic yes it's funny and cute but it's also really bad because the bigger a dragon gets the less active they become because they don't need to move around and stuff like that you know they're going to get fed repeatedly it's like with hand feeding Dragons will become very reliant on being hand fed. If you hand feed your dragon, it's just gonna sit there and wait for you to feed it mm. because it knows you'll eventually you will. So yeah, they're the they're the biggest incorrect misinformation I've heard. Okay. Probably more, but so we have two questions left. Uh, someone wanted to know how do you clean clogged femoral pores and what are the struggles of said job? Right. So basically, if you have clogged femoral pores. The reality is you don't have enough inside that vein for your dragon to naturally clean them himself, like himself. I know females have femoral pores, but the clogged femoral pores is usually a male, a male thing. I know a lot of people advise, oh, get a toothbrush and squeeze them out and watch and people on YouTube doing it. Don't do that. Oh. Don't do that. Like there is a, a high chance you're not a professional. You are not a vet. There is a chance you're going to hurt and damage your dragon. My advice would to be, if it's incredibly clogged, give them a soak. Mm. After that, add more bark and branches and stuff. Rough edges, but not sharp. Oh, yeah, some rough stuff. So it, when it's naturally moving and when they naturally shed, they rub on stuff. Like we'll watch the dragons when they're about to shed. They'll start scraping the head on things. They'll scratch their own back. You know, they'll whip the tail on things. Give them stuff they, they can, like a human hairbrush. Mm. So when we need to detangle our hair, we use a brush. Give your dragon the natural things that it would use in the wild to keep itself healthy because they know what they're doing. It's just not, it's just when they're not given the tools. They can't do problem. what they don't have. Exactly. So, yeah, for more pause, usually is a sign that it's not got something adequate enough for it to keep them clear. Give it a soak, let it get a bit softer, and then give it some coat box, something it can rub on. And please don't squeeze them. That's the only thing I can say. Please don't try and remove them yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're concerned, take them the vets. The vets know what they're doing. An exotic vet will know how to remedy the problem. Please don't, don't, don't. I know I've seen so many people 
recommending oh this youtube video it shows you how to squeeze them and stuff please don't please don't but i have seen lots of vets say oh this is what a fun part of the job i enjoy doing this you know like mm. and stuff. i have actually seen exotic vets say yeah we enjoy this it's satisfying to unclog it so please take it to the vet they'll probably be more than happy to assist you with that mm. Final question is, how did you guys get into breeding or what what prompted you to get into breeding or want to breed? I will leave this one to Stacey. I don't breed. Stacey is the mastermind, knows things like the back of her hand. So. so I wanted to get into breeding because I always used to spend a lot of time going in the local reptile shop and you could never really handle any of the geckos and the dragons because they just weren't handleable at all they didn't want to be in your hands they wanted to jump back out and I just thought I'd love to create healthy reptiles that I can say to people oh yeah these you know you can pick these up you know without fear of being bitten or anything like that or them jumping out your hand or that kind of thing and thinking they can fly yeah, and because of reading all the genetic side of things, which really interested me, I wanted to do very, very small scale selective breeding. So you'll know yourself because I've told you before, but I only purr one dragon a year and it's always within what I'm... So in my head, I only purr one dragon a year, but in my head, I've got the next six years planned out for one dragon per year. And that's to further my own projects each time. If a female who I had planned to purr doesn't look ready or anything like that, then that's fine. It just doesn't happen. It's no big deal to me because first and foremost, they're my pets. I'd rather them be healthy and happy than force anything on them that the body wouldn't be ready for. Of people and, forget that, don't they? Yeah, and the most important thing to me is, I know that you can breed dragons from 18 months old and that kind of thing but I like them to be over two years old so that they really are they've got the stockiness because even females are quite stocky they've got the fat reserves behind them they've got the growth behind them they just they just look more capable of handling a breeding season than what a dragon under two years old looks and that's just personal preference. People can breed younger than that. People do breed younger than that. But I prefer to breed over two years old with female dragons and over one year old with male dragons, preferably actually more 18 months old. Whenever I tend to do a purring, the male is usually around 18 months old at the time. So I, I got into breeding because I just, I wanted to produce not just good quality animals but animals that are handleable for me and now that I've had kids for my children as well so that they can enjoy them I wanted to produce stuff that I could keep keep back myself and enjoy without worrying that they was going to jump off and hurt themselves I work a lot on the personality side of things when I breed animals I only really breed for what I feel I can manage with having two small young children as well. Still enjoy doing because when it stops being an enjoyment, then it's not really a hobby. So I feel like I can give more of my time to a smaller amount of quality reptiles than I can to a huge, huge amount of reptiles because my circumstances differ to the next person someone else might be able to manage that level of reptiles I personally couldn't and I don't want to because I just feel like I couldn't spend as much time as I wanted with each reptile if I had that level of reptiles so for me it's all about providing quality genetics and knowing exactly what goes into that animal and being able to say to someone yeah I know exactly what's in that animal And there's no sort of falsifying anything. There's no, you know, hiding anything. It's all just completely transparent, completely honest. This is this was the purring. This this is the purrants. This is what this is what's in your animal that I've just given you. And that for me is worth more than any type of mass breeding. So yeah, that's that's what I I got into. And also because I just love I just love reptiles and babies. I think that's it for the questions, isn't it? Yeah, that was all the questions.
I think this podcast, I've had a couple people message looking forward to the yeah, more informative, yeah. in-depth podcast. Like I've had a couple of people quite excited for those, like this one, for instance, and obviously the Leo one we have coming up, probably a Cresty one, you know, Tortoise, you know, all those sort of things that we all have experience with. Thanks to everyone that submitted questions. That was the last one. I'll be uploading the new Bearded Dragon Curse Sheet to the files on Reptile Intelligence UK. So alongside the curse sheet that's going up, there's also already a sheet on Bearded Dragon Safe fruits and vegetables. So that is also on the files on Reptile Intelligence UK. So we would like to say a massive thank you to Stacey for sharing her wonderful knowledge with us today on Beardies. We hope you found that really interesting or as interesting as we did. Me personally found it very, very informative because obviously I don't keep Beardies, but I do want to. I want like 10. No, that's a lie. I don't actually want 10. It was also a lie. I would so have 10 if I had the space. Maybe I have 11. No, that's an odd number. That feels weird. Thank you for listening. Uh, We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, afternoon, whenever you decide to listen. And we will see you next week for The Leo Life with a special guest. Very special. We're very excited to have her on. We have Chloe's Geckos UK. We will be having her coming on next week to talk all things Leos, all things projects. And I am super excited to hear all about her amazing project. If you're a a Leo lover and you want to hear about some really cool Leos from a really cool person, I definitely look out for next week's podcast. So thanks again for listening. Thanks again for all your support. And we are looking forward to having another chat with you next week. Toodles. Bye. Bye.